What's up, America? Today is a different day. We've had 10 days of protest and riots, and it's really interesting what has happened because this is the first time in my 53 years on the planet that I have seen this thing happen. This time, the incident with George Floyd is radically different because you have white people speaking to white people about racism. And I'm gonna talk about why this is important and why you need to actually listen in to the conversations because it's a little different this time. It's changed a little bit because I was on the Facebook machine today and I saw some stuff that flipped my mind because I'm gonna give you the reason that it flipped my mind and based upon my previous interactions on the Facebook. If this is your first time here, what I want you to do is to go ahead and enroll in 30 Days to 2500. It's a free course to help you start your side business or maybe your permanent business. Get that and also the hustler's mindset, pimping your mind for success. Let's kinda just go back down memory lane. I used to be one of those people who used to argue with folks on the internet. Yes, I was one of those people and I used to go deep. I used to get hard. I used to be like, ah, and during some of these earliest, like literally 10 years ago, some of these conversations, I actually provoked white people to change their behavior because one of my biggest gripes with white people was, all right, you keep acting like there ain't no racism. You keep talking about there ain't no racism, but you got a racist white friend, a racist relative, a raceless family member. You've got that. They've said racist stuff and you sat on your hands and you kept your mouth closed because you didn't want the tension. Cause see, this is one of the things I'm from Alabama and we got an expression, white folks from LA white folks from lower Alabama. And we used to call these white folks the white folks who would scare white folks because you know what's worse than being treated like a black person, being treated worse than a black person? Being a white person being treated as a black person lover. They get worse treatment. They get worse conversation and white people know this. And they've been acting for the longest of times that they didn't have these racist cousins, these racist friends. Because th I used to like, look, the next time you're in a meeting and when someone white says something racist, you need to check them. Because when I, as a black person says this, oh, I'm just being oversensitive and all this other stuff. But see, coming from you, it's going to carry more weight. And today I saw that for the first time I I've got a very mixed demographic of friends on Facebook. And I actually saw white people amongst themselves talking about the brutish hell of racism. And this girl, she's like, she's about 30 something. And she admitted that she heard the N word in high school. This is like 12, 15, almost 20 years ago. And she's like, yes, I, and then she's talking to her friend. It's like, I heard the same thing. And for the longest of time, they would act like this wasn't happening. Like, well, no, racism is only in your mind, black person. Racism doesn't exist. I'm not racist. I don't know anyone that's racist. And today I'm just looking at these conversations amongst white folks who are talking about the painful memories of racism and racist associates who were white. It was crazy. And I feel it's a little different this time. And, you know, to, to my black folks, you know, this is one of the things that had to happen for racism to start being stamped out because racism renews. I'm going to tell you, I must be the magical Negro because I've really gone back into the data banks and I only remember indirectly being called nigger two times in my life, two times. And I, I, I will, I will explain this situation. First of all, I got to go back to my elementary school, Adamsville elementary school, which was in Adamsville, Alabama. 
we had approximately even distribution numbers of race. We had about 50% black, 50% white. This presented a harmonious situation because there wasn't more of us, there wasn't more of them, and the white people who attended Adamsville Elementary and their parents were pretty cool. You know, I mean, I, I was never called nigger in elementary school. I never even heard it, never dealt with it. Now, this is where things begin to change. We left Adamsville Elementary and we went to Bodenville, which was the middle school, which was a dumping where the racial demographics drastically change. It went from 50-50 to 80-20. And this is when all kinds of craziness stuff happened because I was having a conversation and this is why, like I said, I was called indirectly nigger twice the first time I was having a conversation with Vicky and Vicky is someone I knew from the first grade into the sixth grade. And she used to live behind Mr. Tate's grocery store. And one day I was just, I was visiting some friends cause there was this railroad track and I had crossed the railroad track and I was walking and I saw Vicky and I, I just started talking to her cause I knew her, you know, we went to school together and everything. And you know, she was talking back to me. It was a, friendly conversation until I mentioned that Vicky used to have a crush on Ricky. Vicky loved herself some Ricky. I mean, whenever Ricky was around, Vicky would show up. I mean, it was clear this girl was crazy about Ricky and Ricky happened to be my best friend and Ricky happened to be black. And I was like, Hey, you know, it's been, you know, and Ricky moved away and I was like, Hey, I remember we used to be crazy about Ricky. Then her whole, body language and everything instantly changed. And she's like, I don't like no niggers. Just like that. First time I ever heard that word out of her mouth. And this is why I say, cause you know, Ricky was black. I'm black. I was not so callously confused to think that she was only talking about Ricky. She was talking about everybody was black when she used that word and said it in the manner that she said. And I was just like, but Vicky, you used to love yourself some Ricky. Every time he came around, you would come up, you would hold his hand and, oh no, she, she was like, no, no, no. And then I began to piece together why Vicky was acting like this because Vicky's grandfather was sitting on the porch and he got a little prickly when I showed up, but he didn't say nothing. And when I said that, she said instantly, she was like, nope, I don't like no niggers. She didn't say you were a nigger, but I don't like no niggers. Never happened, never happened. And she got very defensive. She even got a little hostile. And the way that she got hostile, she got up in my face and let me know with pure determination that she wasn't about that life. And I'm like, Dude, go back to the Mary Banks. I remember the time that you and Ricky, and she just stormed off. Cause see, she and Ricky kissed. And see, you know, she want granddad to hear that her virgin pure white lips had touched the lips of a nigger. She didn't want that to happen. And she walked off. Well, I'll see you later. I gotta go. And she walked off and she shut that conversation down quickly. I was like confused. I was like, I'm, you know, I was just perplexed. And I went home and everything. And I didn't think about it. Then the second time that I got indirectly called a nigger was at Bodenfield. Now this was with Lisa Weeks and Lisa Weeks mother was one of the first women to infiltrate the Birmingham police department. So she was a trailblazer. Actually, they actually, I was, cause the way the Adamsville was, I used to walk to school in the morning and many times that they, you know, her mother would be taking her to school. They would just stop by and pick me up. I mean, it was like really crazy because, you know, if you're a northerner and you talk about the racism in the South, it's very kind of crazy how racism was in the South for me growing up because there was this weird social dynamic that was happening because racist white people and black folks got along very well until the numbers shifted because that's what I remember because we were cool at Adamsville. Everybody was cool until the numbers shifted and we went to Bodenfield. So I was 
we was in the gym and then Lisa, and Lisa actually used, to, like Ricky, Ricky, pretty Ricky. Ricky was the dude, Ricky was the man. Ricky was, he was slim, he was charismatic. He had that look, he had that alpha look, the chiseled chin and everything. Cause Lisa Weeks used to love herself some Ricky. And I was just sitting there and you know, and I bust out and I was like talking and she was talking to her new Bodenfield people. Bodenfield people came from Graysville, Dulcina, Huey, not Huey Town, um, Forestdale. So there was this infloration of white people from various sectors of Alabama all dumping into Bodenfield. And many of them, which like Vicki and her granddad, racist granddad, they were indoctrinated with that racism doctrine because like I said, I remember many a times that Lisa's mother would stop, pick me up, I'd get in the car and everything, and we got along, we were cool. We were really, really cool. Then I just, one day, you know, and this is many years after this incident with Vicky, and I was like, hey Lisa, we're just sitting there talking, and I was like, you remember when you used to love yourself some Ricky? I don't like no niggers. And I was like, where have I heard this before? And she was with her new Bodenfield friends and she was like, no, that ain't happened, that ain't happened. And I am almost sure that Lisa and Ricky also kissed. Like I said, pretty Ricky, Ricky was the dude. And I was just sitting there like, I've been here before. I've had this dream before. And it was the same proximity that if I had said that to Lisa or Vicky, and like Vicky with her grandfather, he wasn't around, she wouldn't have responded like this. And the same thing with Lisa, but for some reason that the infection of racism makes white people do crazy and stupid and dumb things. Because I've known Lisa for like, at that point, seven, eight years, and she had only known these white people literally a few months. And she, cause it, she was like the co-opting of the white people. And I was just like, oh, okay. And instantly I just excused myself from the situation. And this is why, once again, when she used that term and the way that she used it, I knew she was talking about me too. It wasn't like, you know, you're, you're not included in that. No, I was included in that. And I was just like, and the relationship changed. And I remember about six months after that, one day I was uh, out in the hallway and I ran to Lisa and she stopped and she said, hey, you know what happened a few months ago? That wasn't me. And this is one of the biggest problems that we as black folks have with white folks is the denial. And I was like, Lisa, that was you. I don't know why it was you that day, but it was you. And you used to love yourself some Ricky. I even think y'all kissed. And she's what? You kissed a nigger? Is that the problem? And it, it was the craziest thing. And you know, during these protests, I am seeing white women. I love black dick. And that's a whole nother video right there. That's a whole nother video because knowing what I know today, cause at the time I was a young man, I didn't really know anything. I didn't have any mentors, but knowing what I know the way, the way that Vicky came up to me, I could have gave her a little black dick because she wasn't afraid of me. She got really aggressive. She got right up in my face and I think she was kind of turned on. I really think that was the case. And this, this is a weird situation where white women who are racist will have intimate relations with black men and love it. How many of you know who uh, Vin Diesel, he's a porn star. You know, he, he kind of looks a little bit like the other Vin Diesel. I, I forget his name, but he's a porn star. He looks like uh, the fast, too furious guy, except he's bigger and more muscular. And the guy was doing an interview and he was saying, you know, some of my biggest fans are racist and KK. Like, yeah, get that little white girl the big black dick. Give it to her, give it to her. And it, it's the strangest thing. It is the strangest thing because you're racist, but you like watching big black dudes give little tiny white women the dick. He, he was like, he said, it just cracked me up. 
that, you know, from Stormfront, all of these racist white dudes love to watch his videos. So that is a weird, weird relationship between black men and white women on that tip. But going up, those are the only two times that I was referred to, and I include myself because I'm not stupid, as a nigger from the time that I was born up until now. That's the only two times in my life I've heard that expressed to me. I've never been beat up by the cops. I've been, I used to be a speeder. I used to be like zoom, heavy foot. I got like three tickets in two months, was about to lose my license, gotten all these points. I sat there, the cops never disrespected me. No, you know, I do believe I was racially profiled when I had my business and off in Stone Mountain. Because every time I turned around, I was getting pulled over by the cab police. I think the cab police were the worst. I, I do believe that was going down because I was never doing anything. I was never speeding. And every time I was like, Whoop, I'm like, what is this? And this is when I changed the registration of the van from my name to a business name and it stopped. Very key point there, really, really key point. But right now, the first time in my 53 years on the planet, I am seeing white people have conversations, difficult, painful conversations about race with white people. It is about damn time. Cause I'm, I'm just sitting there like, I was like a fly on the wall. I was sitting there with just like, oh, ooh wee. She actually said that she hurt. Cause see, when I used to fight with people on the internet, they would always deny, oh, no, I don't know any racist people. None of my, I'm like, dude, I grew up in Alabama. I know how you white folks get down. I know how you got a racist ass grandfather, grandmother, somewhere up in your family because if they 60, 70, 80 years old, the chances of them being racist are so great and they are gonna feed that crap to you. And y'all been denying this stuff for years, like, oh, it didn't happen, Glenda, no, no, no. I knew it happened. I know how y'all get down, even if you are not a orange, uh, let's see, an advertly, outwardly racist white person, you are racist because you don't check racism because you like when you're in the meeting and it's just nothing but white folks and the guy comes in and starts making nigger jokes and you go ha 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 and you feel bad inside but you do nothing about it that's the problem this is how this crap keeps perpetuating this is how it keeps going on because you my dear white person are not checking the racist white people just like the good cops are not checking the bad cops. And this is how this infection of racism keeps going and flourishing. And, and this is like the first time I've ever seen this. And it's, it is long overdue, white people. It is long overdue. Because y'all have been acting like, well, you, you black folks, I don't know what this racism thing you're talking about. I don't see it, I don't experience it. I don't have any racist for what? No. If you're white, the chance of you having a racist ass white friend relative is so great that any black person with just a little bit of common sense knows this. And right now you got white people out there denouncing their white privilege, which I think is carrying it a bit far but it is some level of different conversations that are going on right now that have not gone on in these United States of America ever before. And it is about damn time. Because, you know, for me, I have to be honest and say that racism really hasn't impacted my life. But my name ain't Jamal. My name's not Leroy. My name's not too short. And, you know, like George Floyd, going back to the Candace Owens videos, which was just tacky, what does his past have to do with him during that moment when the cop, you know, even Candace was like, well, yeah, what the cop did was wrong, but George Floyd, we shouldn't make, why shouldn't we? 
Why shouldn't George Floyd be a representative of change, an agent of change? Why shouldn't he? Because that's what I see George Floyd is. He's an agent of change. He gave his life. He lost his life. He was murdered. And this has facilitated change. And we celebrate people who facilitate change. Martin Luther King facilitated change. We celebrate him. George Patton, General George Patton facilitated change. We, we celebrate him. Franklin, uh, FDR, uh, let's see, the Kennedy. Um, we, we celebrate people who facilitate change. We put up monuments to them. We study them. We write history books about him. And George Floyd was an agent of change. So why shouldn't we celebrate George? Many emperors, many kings were corrupt. And we've got statues and Bibles. King James, he, 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 checked, he changed the Bible. King James, the King James version of the Bible. King James just like, hey, put a little pepper, put a little salt, a little spice on this Bible. I'm gonna change this word to Lord and all this. King James completely rewrote the Bible. So why shouldn't we celebrate George Floyd? Like Candace, like I said before, you didn't know George. You can't speak to his character without knowing him. You can just sit back and poke assumptions to feed your GOP backed, baited breath people who are like, yeah, speak that, speak that, speak that talk, Candace. Say the things I want to say, but I can't say. Speak it. And you know, it, it's like George Floyd, like I've never seen anything like this ever in life. I've never seen anything like this. And the conversations need to keep going because white people need to start checking white people. Because when I'm a black person, it's like, oh, you racist. Oh, that's easy. But when you know you're a grandmother, you've been racist your whole life, and your nine-year-old granddaughter's like, Grandma, that's wrong. She ain't black. She has no agenda. She just told you you were wrong and now you got to check yourself. I'm about to tell you the craziest story that happened years and years and years ago. When I was at Schofield Barracks, we used to get down with a lot of stuff because we were in the barracks. We were horny little troops and everything. And one of my best friends, Alex, he got Becky. Her name was Rebecca. She was really Becky pregnant. Now, Alex was black and Becky was white. And Becky knew she was just like, oh my God, my family's gonna flip out. And she's like, why? Cause she's like, my family's racist. And I'm like, really? She said, yeah. And you know, Becky's father was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. You know, this did not go over well with Alex giving Becky the D with her dad. And you know, she was in the military, he was in the military. Uh, they had the cutest little baby. And then Becky's parents came to Hawaii to visit the new, their first born grandchild. The Ku Klux Grand Dragon came to Hawaii. Cause uh, Alex was like, man, you know, you gonna come over here? Cause I don't know how this gonna go down. So I was over there, Alonzo was over there. You know, we were, we were stacked deep. Cause you know, this is our boy and we got our boys back and we, and this, this guy, he, he ain't bigger than nothing. Dude's like five, seven, five, eight, a little skinny, little wiry guy. You can tell he has some muscle on him and stuff. And he comes in and he, he looks at us as like gentlemen, he shakes our hands and everything. And the first time he held his granddaughter, this man flipped. He flipped. He completely flipped. And, you know, he was very nice to Alex and the wife. She was looking paranoid because she knew the wife wasn't racist, but she knew her husband was racist. And she was like, what's going to happen? What's going to go down? And this dude, he immediately fell in love with that little baby girl and his racist past stopped. And he actually talked to us about, you know, I was brought up in the South and, you know, black folks and white folks didn't mix, but this is the beautiful, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't put that little child down. That was a part of him. That was a part of
Okay. No, I'm just doing the regular video. Cause the how I thought that was the housekeeper because they're supposed to be coming close. And he literally transformed that day. And this is one of the things that so many people don't want to see is one of the agents of transformation that when people get together and start producing babies. And this dude, you know, and like Alex left and they went home and Alex was like, man, dude was super nice to me. All the neighbors were nice to me. Cause see, this was the Ku Klux Klan dragon. He had some weight, he had some pull. He told people to do some stuff, they fall in line. It was crazy. I want you to think about that. And I'll never forget to seeing this dude cause you know, I heard about Klan members, but I had never met one openly that knew, knew he was a Klan member. And it was crazy what happened. It was crazy how this all went down. It was crazy how I saw the love in this formerly racist man's eyes for his granddaughter. I saw that love, I felt it. And this is one of the things that's happening now with the event of George Floyd, the riots, the conversations that are happening. Right now, America, once again, this is the global reset and we're having a reset on race relations. We're not anywhere where we need to be yet, but we're moving forward. And that's something worth recognizing and acknowledging because we're getting to a place where people are having painful and honest conversations, which in themselves produce change, which creates a new level of understanding, which creates a new level of being. So, you know, George Floyd was an agent of change. And we should celebrate that. All right, for those of you who have been enlightened and you wanna keep being enlightened, go below, get 30 days to 2,500. Go below, get the hustler's mindset, pimping your mind for success. And also for those of you who want to go to the next level, probably later this week, I'm gonna be doing a live webinar. There's already a lot there. How to make money from scratch course, below, that's below, and I give you a discount on how to get there. Because, you know, like I said, personally, I have lived a somewhat privileged life and I understand that and I can recognize that, but there have been so many people who haven't and this is their time to shine and this is their time for change and this is the time for them to heal their wounds. So with that, I'll see you guys in the next video.